today um, I'm just doing a little bit of deviation from just outright teaching, just to admonish us, admonish us, encourage us in the Lord with a different kind of um, approach, just a message, just to admonish us, you know, just help us to, to overcome certain things in our life. But it's important for you to take note of what I'm teaching on today. To help you, it will also help people as we begin to counsel people in the future. The Lord just impressed upon my heart to just do this teaching. I don't know who it is for. It's also for me. It helps me too. Praise God. So today, uh, my topic today would be, how much does your past matter with God? How much does your past matter with God? That's the topic I'm teaching on today. And I take my reading from Revelations chapter 5, beginning from verse 1. And I'll stop at verse 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. And he says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open this book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. The Lord bless the reading of his word. The book and the seals mentioned in this passage should not make a doctrine. The book and the seals were just a symbol of communicating a situation to the apostle. Book, as I became a believer, I said, I hear about the book. Your name is not written in the book. Your name is in the book. Your name is not written in the book. And every believer is made to believe that there's one book. Some even think that once you sin, they clear your name from that book. And when you repent, they enter your name again. Some people think their name is in ink. Some people think their name is in pencil. All those are not important. The book is communicate. It's just a symbol, something that was used to communicate this message to the Apostle John. And he was able to express it in something that he can relate to. So both the book and the seals, the seven seals, are just a symbol. The message of the angel in this whole chapter, if you go through the whole chapter five, is evidently to honor Jesus Christ, period, the Lamb of God, by showing that the power was entrusted to him alone. The power entrusted to him was confided to no one else in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth the power to disclose what is going to unfold, what the world, what God's plan is, what eternity holds. 
of that power is only confided in one person. Nothing else would better illustrate this than the fact that he alone, he alone could break the seal, the mysterious seals, sealing the mystery, the mystery book that bears the knowledge of the future. He holds my future. My life is what I live in joy because he lives. Jesus is the only one that has the knowledge of the future. He holds the knowledge of the future, which was as at that time hidden from all created human eyes. The fact that no one in heaven or earth could do it. The tears shed by John when it was found out that no one else could do it. The assurance given to John by one of the elders that the lion of the tribe of Judah had power to do it. And the profound adoration of all in heaven and on earth and under the earth in view of this power and the worship shows that Jesus is uniquely placed holding the future in his hands and the knowledge of the future. So, but what our study today is, why is Christ referred to as Lion of Judah and the Root of Judah? The Root of David. He said, behold, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. He described Jesus by these two accolades, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and the root of David. These typologies point to the prophecies which preceded the incarnation of Christ. Before Jesus came in the flesh, these prophecies preceded his coming. The most common of these two typologies, however, is the one that is in connection to David. The root of David is the more the one that is more connected, that is more known, that is more popular. So these typologies point to the prophecies. And the most common of them is the one in connection to David. The angel of the Lord said to John in Revelation 22, 16, if you go further down. He said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony to the church. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. That is a self-introduction. In Isaiah chapter 11 from verse 1, we get the prophecy of Isaiah 500 years before Jesus' incarnation. He said, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesus, David was the son of Jesse. So he's still pointing to this David, Davidic connection. A branch shall grow out of his root. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. When I was doing this study and I came to this particular verse, I had something, an impression in my spirit. I had a joy in my spirit. When I considered this spirit that I itemized here, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And then he's describing this spirit of the Lord. He said the spirit of wisdom and understanding, number one. The spirit of counsel and might, number two. The spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. 
These four things speak to the life of not only Christ, but everyone who is so blessed to be found in Christ. If you can take a deep study of these four spirits mentioned here, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, these spirits ought to be operating fully in every believer. And if you are operating in these things, you will, you will have the joy of being a child of God. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, it will take you far. The spirit of counsel and mind, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. However, Christ's connection to David in prophecy is not biological as a natural offspring of David. Many people think that once they say Christ is David, they say, well, uh, Joseph was from the lineage of David and Mary was also from one side. That's not where the, 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 the Christ connection to David, the Davidic connection in prophecy is not biological. It is prophetic. Jesus himself tried to make, make, make this very, very clear. If you go to Matthew chapter 22, in Matthew 22 from verse 41, we find Jesus making clear this thing very, very clear, what I just said now. He said, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think he of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, the son of David. Jesus looked at them and laughed. He said, he said unto them, how then does David call in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand, till I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he David's son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither did any man from that day ask him any more questions. He shut their mouth. He was trying to make it clear to them that when you see at the root of David, they are not looking at David's biological son. I'm not, from, I'm not biologically connected to David. I, I'm prophetically connected to him. So Christ's connection to David and God's promise of the Messiah coming from his lineage was common knowledge, was common knowledge, was prophetic. But God prophesied unto David. You remember there was a blind man called Bartimaeus. Even a blind man knew that. He too addressed Christ as the son of David. So Christ's connection with David was common knowledge. In Luke chapter 18, verse 35, the Bible says, and he came to pass. As Jesus came nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked, what is this? What does this noise mean? And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Blind man. So here is the connection between Christ, Jesus, and David. David was a warrior. He was a prophet. And he was king, royalty at the same time. Just like David, Christ is the deliverer. He's an everlasting high priest. And he's also the king of kings. So the part of our opening text that is not perhaps well known in scriptures is the one, the connection to Judah, the lion of Judah. 
The root of David is common, but the lion of Judah is the part of it that we are not. He said, behold, the lion of Judah and the root of David. So that part that is not well known is what we are going to be dwelling on tonight. Especially, what is the implication of linking Christ to Judah? Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us thus far. My God, release the unction to comprehend. Release the spirit of counsel and understanding. The spirit of wisdom to every hearer of my voice right now. And those that will hear this message, whichever medium, podcast, TV, internet, whichever medium, release counsel, release understanding and wisdom and light in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So the first mention of Judah in connection to Christ is in Matthew chapter 1. In the first mention of Judah, the genealogy of Christ. The Matthew chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. He said, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren. And Judas, that's the man we are talking about, begat Phares and Zara of Taman. And Phares begat Esra, and Esra begat Aram. So Judas, who is this Judah that we are talking about? Who is the lion? Why is Jesus called the lion of the tribe of Judah? Who is Judah? Why is he important? Who is he? What are the implications of Christ being linked to Judah? And what is the implication of that to a New Testament believer? What, how does it affect us? Judah's inclusion in the lineage of Christ proves to you that no matter who you are or what you may have done or what your past ever looks like, once God gets involved, your past doesn't matter anymore. Your past does not matter. I say that again. Judah's inclusion in the lineage of Christ speaks eloquently to the fact that no matter who you are, what you are or what you have done in your past, once God gets involved, your past really doesn't count. Because our Lord is a sovereign and he is a destiny changer. The name Judah means praise. And this man named Judah comes from a lineage of people who have trusted the one and true God, the only true God. From Jacob, his immediate son of Jacob, Jacob trusted God. Jacob's father, Isaac, who is Judah's grandfather, trusted God. And Abraham, who is his great grandfather, trusted God. He was called a friend of God. So he called Judah comes from a lineage of devotees to the one true God. His father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather. But in spite of that rich lineage, Judah still derailed. He derailed, went off track. Judah was the first son of Jacob. It was he particularly who suggested to his brother that they should sell Joseph for 20 shekels of silver. He called them, said, don't waste your time with this man. Let's sell him to the slaves. Let's sell him as a slave to these people. He called the people who were passing. The Arab says, we want to sell this man. We want to, can you buy him? And they sold their brother, Joseph to the Egyptians for 20 shekels of silver. 
After all that, they came back, he lied to his father. He said, the animals are eating their son. Look at the, his cloth. They brought the coat of many colors, stained with blood. And Jacob was weeping. So day in, day out, this lie was haunting Judah. Until one day, he decided to bolt away from the family. He bolted away. And the Bible says he went to a far country. He traveled. He went to another country, went to a far country. And the moment he arrived in the far country, he hopped onto a Canaanite woman, a strange woman, called Shua. Just met her, probably we know it, yeah. I marry you, I love you. Just he went into the woman. A woman that knew nothing about the God of his fathers. Just pure physical infatuation and sensuality drove him at this point. He was no longer, was no longer interested. He had lost all semblance of religion and family devotion. Like most young people do when they leave home. When they leave home, they think that they are free from mommy and daddy's trouble, all the praying in the house, all the going to church, all the, the singing in the choir, they just dump all those at home. And they find a new freedom. So Judah got to this place, forgot the God of his fathers, forgot the family lineage, forget the devotion, and just hop into a Canaanite woman. They take everything and they put it in the back corner. Embrace secular life and philosophy of life. So fast forward. I just want to fast forward to Judah. Then Judah's son marries. He had a son. And that is son. Yeah, God also did the same thing his father did. He got him a wife from the Canaanite. The lady called Tamar. And that one also, he didn't have a son. Before he knew it was a wicked man, the Bible described him as a wicked man, and he died. Then the second son hopped onto the same woman. Judah said, it's okay, go into the woman, go into the woman. That married her too. Just living careless life. And that one was also a wicked man. The Bible calls him a wicked man, and he died. And this woman was still alive and still young. Instead of releasing this woman to go, he said, no, you will not go. You are going to go, go and wait in your father's house until my third child grows up and becomes mature enough. See wickedness. So this lady, according to the culture, many cultures in this world are against women. She went to her father's house, was waiting. And when this third son grew up, Judah, is, Judah said, no, I'm not giving it to you because I don't want this one to die too. Two have died in your hand. And yet he will not release the woman to marry a man of her choice. So many traditions are holding women down and men are supervising it. Even women themselves are supervising these wicked traditions that hold them down. Women are also where these things are being implemented. And then what happens? Fast forward again. Judah's wife now dies. And then he now has no wife. He started jumping from one halot to the other. He started living a godless life. Started hopping around. This is how a godless life rules. Because sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will take you further than you want to go. You want to stop at this junction. It takes you three junctions after that and embarrass you. So this godless life, Judah at this point had completely forgotten who he was. 
He forgot the lineage he came from. He forgot the meaning of his name, praise. He forgot the God of his fathers and was just rolling and rolling from one halal to the other. Then Tama, because she was agreed, Tama's life now represents misery, disillusionment, bondage. This lady was just in bondage. So she seized the opportunities. Okay, now that I hear that he goes around with her lot, here I come, I'm going to teach him a lesson. So she removed her morning clothes that she has worn for years. She put on, dressed up herself like a young lady. The Bible calls it the attire of a harlot. I don't know what it used to be in those days. But right now, I know what the attire of a harlot is. When I see a harlot, I know. It doesn't need to be a professional harlot. When you are dressing to expose your body, expose your breast, or expose any part of your body, the Bible calls it the attire of a harlot. So the lady quickly dressed up and went and laid ambush for this sensual man, for this wicked man, this godless ruler. So as Judah was passing by, he saw her, beheld her, and quickly went to her and negotiated a date. Not only did he negotiate a date, he was broke. He didn't have money. So he negotiated to sleep with her on credit. Who does that? Going to a lot is depraved enough. But going on credit means you are, you are utterly depraved. He went and said, I don't have money, but in two weeks' time, I'll bring you my a big goat. And the lady said, well, I don't, I don't want to live on promises. You have to give me something, a collateral, so that when you bring the goat, you will take your collateral. He said, what do you want? He said, give me your belt and your rent. And a depraved man, he removed his ring, he removed his belt. How Men make themselves so weak for nothing. So the lady collected those two things and said, okay, have your fear. And then, naturally, she became pregnant. Tama became pregnant. And come and see righteousness of Judah. Judah called his people, say, no, this is abomination. Cannot happen in my lineage. In my lineage, we don't do things like this. We are going to make sure, we are going to deal with that according to the law. He called on some of the people. Everybody came together. They said the best thing to do is someone, someone said, we we'll stone her. The other said, we we'll, we'll burn her. And why they were saying this thing? You can't bring a bastard into our home. The guy said, well, I have, a, I have something to say. The owner of this belt and the owner of this ring is the father of my child. See, eh? They brought the thing and Judah looked at it. The moment Judah looked at the belt and looked at the ring, he turned his face to the wall and said, well, can we dismiss today? Tomorrow we'll continue. <laughs> he said, let's resume this matter tomorrow. By this time, Judah had been brought down to nothing. Judah had been brought down to nothing. But you would think that Judah was finished. You would think that Judah was finished, that everything had been finally sinks to his lowest point of sin and loss of reputation. But God's grace is superfluous. At this point, when Judah was at his lowest, the grace of God kicked in. Because God's grace is bigger than any destiny shattering trouble. 
all the prayer warriors, they tell you there's a destiny shattering trouble. There's no destiny shattering trouble. God is able to recover. The Bible says he called those things that be not. I know the end from the beginning. The destiny of Judah kicked in. With men, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Because there is hope for everyone. That person you think is not interested in God at all. Or that person you think he has gone too far to be recovered by God. There is still hope for that person. So for Judah, the moment of destiny is about to kick in. Maybe for you too. I don't know what your past has been. I don't know why God is asking me to teach on this. Or rather to preach on this. Whatever you think has shattered your destiny, God is saying to you right now, as you are hearing this message, you can seize this moment and recover your destiny through Christ Jesus. That is why Jesus went to cross. The Bible says he's he, he was made a captain that he might bring many sons unto glory. He's bringing you, as Jesus is in, he's bringing you unto glory. That's your destination. Irretrievably, you are going to glory. So, in Judah's case, one trouble led to the other. His lost reputation, famine came, hunger, he has no reputation, no money, his children are dead, his wife is dead. Even the she just problem. So at some point he had to go because Tamar had already delivered twins. So he had to take them, take Tamar, and this one go back home. And while he was doing this, destiny was also kicking in at home. Their brother that they sold to Egypt had become prime minister. Joseph had become prime minister in Egypt. God orchestrates things on the behalf of these is the beloved. That's why the Bible says all things work together for God. To them that love God and that they call according to his name. Them who are the call. Destiny has changed. The family's destiny is being reserved, preserved in Egypt. Joseph had been named prime minister. And hunger took those ones also to Egypt. The same hunger that drove the farmer and that drove Judah back home, drove them to go and looking for food in Egypt. And lo and behold, this is their brother, prime minister, the one that holds all bread in Egypt. Fast forward again to verse chapter Genesis 42. Joseph now tells them, he taunts them. He says, If you are true, as you are telling me that your father is at home and your brother, one of your brothers is at home, if he is true, send somebody to them to, to go there. I want to see your brother. Leave your father at their, their home. Well, bring that to your brother. I want to see him. That's why I, tell you I know that you are saying the But we are going to detain one of you here. One of you will be kept here as a prisoner until you go and bring that brother. Come back. We were just taunting them. And they were afraid. Say, so God, God has found us out. God is punishing us. And all that and all that. At the end of the day, they went, brought their brother back. and. Joseph revealed himself, confesses to his wicked brothers, reveals his identity to them, forgives them, and the family is united. Every their destiny is recovered. He tells them prophetically that God used this your envy and treachery to preserve our lineage. God sent me ahead of you. You meant evil, but God meant it for good. The Bible said that God commended his love towards us. While we were yet in sin, Jesus died for us. So Jesus is also a type of Joseph. Or oh, Joseph is a type of Christ. He was used by God to work out the destiny of his wicked brethren. 
So Joseph steps in like a type of Christ and brings deliverance to his family. So no matter your circumstances, God's redemption plan is still available to you. You can enter that plan today. You can be an instrument in the hand of God to recover the destiny of your generation, your family. But think about this terrible human being that we have been describing, Judah, this terrible man. Nobody wants to give, I mean, I can't give him a chance. I don't know about you. Ordinarily, nobody wants to give him a chance, not even me. But not so with God. Not so with God. After all that Judah did, when Joseph, Jacob was about to die, on the deathbed of Jacob in Genesis 49, verse 8, Jacob called all his children and lined them up to bless them. And we think that he will bless Joseph more. Or you would think he will bless Benjamin more, this young one that was not part of this conspiracy. Or you would think he will bless Reuben more, who is the first son. But when he came to Judah, looking at Judah, Jacob said, Judah, thou art he whom your brethren shall praise. Your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. That means he's going to be a conqueror and a warrior. Your father's children shall bow before you. Everybody, including Joseph, the prime minister, all of them will bow before you. The scepter, the right to scepter shall not depart, the symbol of authority shall not depart from Judah. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, the Messiah. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. Judah, was Jacob making a mistake? No, that's not a mistake, it's God. God, he blesses whom he chooses. The Bible said the gift and calling of God is without repentance. That's what, why you should understand grace called amazing grace. Judah reconnected to his destiny by prophecy. So next time you hear Jesus being described as the lion of the tribe of Judah, I want you to remember that it's this same guy, this same scoundrel, this same rascal called Judah. Prophecy changed him. Changed his destiny. God's grace can do anything. And if you have received it, do not limit yourself. Do not limit yourself. And how about Tama? Tama is mentioned in the lineage of the Messiah. He came home. And those two children became the carrier, the lineage. Something she never had before. She was a stranger, complete stranger to the promise. But today, if you go to the genealogy of Christ, he said, and Judah begat Phares and Zara of Tamar. Salvation is for everyone. Jesus offered himself for every man. Jews do not own Jesus. Christians do not own Jesus. Pentecostals don't own Jesus, even though they always think that they're the only one that owns Jesus. Pentecostal don't own Jesus. Everyone that calls upon his name shall be saved. Jews, Christians, 
Pentecostal, Muslim, Hindu. The fact that you were born in Hindu land or you, you have had a Hindu background does not stop you from being Christ, to, to receiving Christ. The fact that you are born by an atheist parent does not stop you from embracing Christ. It doesn't matter, Muslim, whatever you are. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world, the world, the world unto himself. The world unto himself. You will think that a man like Judah or a woman like Tamar should not be mentioned. They should be excluded. They should be silent. That name should be silent when you are writing the, the, the genealogy of Christ. But not so with God. God is never ashamed of us. He never ashamed of any man's past. There's nothing in your past limiting you from connecting to your inheritance in Christ. That's what I'm, that's the essence of my message. There's nothing in your past, either by your parents or your grandparents or yourself that you have done that is limiting you from connecting to Christ, the inheritance that has been laid up by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And Jesus is stretching out his arms with outstretched arms saying, come, accept that you have been forgiven. Whatever is in your past, Jesus is not ashamed of you. The Bible says he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. He said, he that, both he that sanctified and they that are sanctified have become one. Wherefore, he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Whatever it is, Jesus is not ashamed of you. I want you to say to yourself, Jesus is not ashamed of me. We're going to pray today that our prayer will be, Lord, in you I live. In you I have my being. Let your purposes fulfill in me, to me and through me. Let your purposes fulfill to me. Fulfill in me and fulfill through me. We're going to be praying. We're going to be praying now. Just worship God. Say, Lord, let your purposes be fulfilled in me, through me, and in me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Let your grace bring me to where you want me to be. I release myself from every limiting factor, from everything limiting me in my mind, everything limiting me in my past. I drop them at the feet of the cross right now. I'm available, have your way, Holy Spirit. I'm available to go the way you have designed for me. The way of my destiny, Lord, I recover it today. Mabo Shalalaki Shibu. Mobelibo Shalalaki Shibu. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of the Slain, for the foundation of the world. Thank you, Jesus. This broadcast is sponsored by Grace and Full Missionary Association. GIFMA in short, an international Bible mission to We are so grateful for your audience today. We welcome your comments, inquiries, and any other forms of feedback you may have. You can visit our website, www.gifma.us, or send us an email at spiritofgrace.gifma.us at gmail.com. If you need prayer or counseling, give us a call, 346-754-0720.
Also, follow our Facebook page, Gift Month, that's G-I-F-M-A. If you're also a gospel minister, you can register there and get mission support. And if you've been blessed by this programming, send us an email with your name and address where you'll receive free DVDs, books, and other materials to keep you growing in grace. Thank you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless your bread and your water. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name.